OK, so let's look at today's questions. Question one, how would you describe Mrs Smith? What do you think Anne admires so much in her? So let's take a look at the novel's description of Mrs Smith. This is on page. 101. <clears throat> uh, OK, so Anne goes to visit Mrs Smith. Anne found in Mrs Smith the good sense and agreeable manners which she had almost ventured to depend on. <clears throat> so remember that Mrs Smith is an old school friend of Anne's. So Anne knew her from way before. So when here it says that she did almost ventured to depend on Mrs Smith's good sense and agreeable manners, this means that when they were younger, Mrs Smith, uh, I guess she was, I forgot her name, Miss Hamilton or something. Uh, before, yeah, Miss Hamilton, before she got married. Miss um, Hamilton did have good sense and agreeable manners. Um, and so Anne is almost venturing to depend on the fact that she still has these. So venture, of course, as we talked about before, means to uh, try. Here means to hope. Um, and depend on usually means uh, rely on, count on. Uh, but here the object is not a person. It's a noun. And to depend on something means to uh, to hope or predict that that thing is still there. So almost ventured to depend on her good sense and agreeable manners means uh, that um, she very much hoped that Mrs. Smith still had her old good sense and agreeable manners. Um, and indeed she does because Anne found them in Mrs. Smith. Uh, and Mrs. Smith also has a disposition to converse, which means chat. And be cheerful beyond her Anne's expectation. So looks like she's a good person. Neither the dissipations of the past. Dissipation means uh, xiao san, like disappearing. Things have disappeared, uh, and usually those things are good things. Uh, so dissipation is like um, bad behavior, immorality of the past. Here of the past. Uh, and she had lived very much in the world. So what does this mean? So um, remember that this is a, a Christian society. And in a Christian society, uh, you are always comparing this world and the next world, for example, heaven. So to live in the next world would be like uh, to be a priest or to be a, a religious person who doesn't really um, take part in many events uh, and interactions with people like business, for example. But this is not the case, right? Mrs Smith had lived very much in the world, so she had many interactions. She had lots of business. Um, so neither the dissipations of the past nor the restrictions of the present, neither sickness nor sorrow seem to have closed her heart or ruined her spirits. So what are these dissipations? What are the restrictions of the present? Uh, let's continue reading. In the course of a second visit, so Anne goes back again, she talked with great openness and Anne's astonishment increased. 
she could scarcely imagine a more cheerless situation in itself than Mrs. Smith's. So this in itself is describing the situation. We will later see that even though the situation is cheerless, very unhappy, Mrs. Smith is not. She is uh, trying her best to be happy and satisfied. So in itself means if you only look at this situation. <clears throat> She had been very fond of her husband. She had buried him, so he died. She had been used to affluence, which means wealth, money. It was gone. She had no child to connect her with life and happiness again. So Remember in the first week when we talked about Lady Elliot and the novel says that when she was about to die, um, she found enough, um, I think it was connection or value in her children to make uh, death not regrettable or not, not unregrettable. So like the idea is even though she was not a happy woman, uh, because of her children and her family, uh, she still felt a some kind of connection to living, to life. So this is the same thing. Here it's saying that Mrs. Smith had no child to connect her with life and happiness. Again, no relations, which means relatives or family, to assist in the arrangement of perplexed affairs. Um, so perplexed means confused. When we talk about a person and we say that th they are confused, we mean they don't know what's going on. But if we talk about a thing or here like a situation, affair is a business. A confused business means that it is hard to deal with. It is not clear. Um, so Mrs. Smith has many things that she has to deal with, but she has no family to help her and no health to make all the rest supportable. In other words, if she had had good health, she may have been able to slowly deal with her own business herself, but she does not have good health. So uh, she does not have the good health to support all the other things that she should do. Um, and what's wrong with her health? We will talk about that just below. Her accommodations, which is where she lives, were limited to a noisy parlor in a dark bedroom behind. So the place where she lives only has two rooms, a bedroom and a parlor. So what is a parlor? The word parlor comes from the French for talk or conversation, parler. Um, so this is uh, what in Chinese we call cutting. In English, it's living room, but of, as we talked about before, um, the the word living room does not mean exactly the same thing as uh, cutting in Chinese. So we previously talked about how when a guest first arrives, you welcome them in the drawing room. You draw them into the house. Um, and from there, you, you are supposed to take the guest to the parlor. That's where uh, visitors would come and sit and chat with the host and with each other. It's the social room. Um, now, if this is a dinner party, um, after your servant has finished preparing dinner, you would all move to the dining room, 
to eat and keep chatting. And then after eating dinner, you would go back to the parlor to continue, uh, maybe with uh, some coffee, a bit of wine, uh, to continue the conversations, maybe even play some games. Um, and so today, what we call dinner party games, like uh, charades, bi so hua jiao, or like uh, to guess a riddle, cai mi, these things uh, used to be called parlor games because you would play them in the parlor with your guests. Um, and sometimes the men, if they wanted to smoke, they would uh, go to a room called the smoking room. Um, and this is in order to avoid making the entire house smell of smoke. When they go to the smoking room, they would have to change into what's called smoking jackets. Now, remember back in those days, uh, it was considered extremely impolite for any man uh, when visiting with uh, anyone who's not a family, if that man was not wearing a suit jacket, Shidrong Wai Tao. Even if you were just like hiking, or gardening, you had to wear some kind of suit jacket. And that's why today we there are so many different kinds of suit jacket. Aside from the formal jacket, you also have uh, the sport jacket for you know exercise. Uh, you have a blazer, qing bian xi zhuang wai tao, for everyday use. And then you have a smoking jacket for uh, going to the smoking room. And this is to prevent third hand smoke, san so yin. Uh, so we know first hand smoke is when I myself smoke. Second hand smoke is when someone near me smokes and I smell the smoke. Third hand smoke is when someone smokes, they leave, but the smell of smoke is still on things, on clothing in the room. And studies have shown that third hand smoke also causes cancer. So even though back in those days, uh, changing into a smoking jacket and going to the smoking room uh, is mostly to be polite uh, and to prevent um, smoke from spreading throughout the house, uh, it was also more healthy. And uh, because it was mostly men who smoked, um, so it was mostly men who went to the smoking room. And so the smoking room became also a place for men to chat among themselves. Kind of like how today some women will go together to the bathroom uh, simply to chat and to socialize. Uh, OK, so back to the story. Mrs Smith only has a parlor and a bedroom with no possibility of moving from one to the other without assistance. Why? OK, so I think the health part is is uh, over here. Uh, a bit higher on page 101. Let's see. Um, where is it? OK, I'm going to I'm going to search for it. Top of page 101. So this is her. This is Mrs Smith's situation. She was a widow and poor. Her husband had been extravagant, which means he spent a lot of money. And at his death, about two years before, had left his affairs dreadfully involved. Uh, so involved, we don't use this word like this today anymore. But involved here means uh, entangled. It's still um, related to other kinds of business. Remember, affair means business. So think about this. Uh, what kind of business does not end after someone dies. Usually it's money business. 
if you owe someone money uh, and uh, you still have living family members that can pay it off for you. So by saying that his affairs were still dreadfully involved, it means they still owed people a lot of money. Um, so involved here means like entangled, connected, is unable to be separated. She had had difficulties of every sort to contend with, and in addition to these distresses, had been afflicted with a severe rheumatic fever. So rheumatism is the old word for what today we would call arthritis, jiguan fa yin. Um, and she has a fever which causes rheumatism, which finally settling in her legs had made her for the present a cripple. Uh, so because of her arthritis, she can't walk. Uh, let me give you this word. Arthritis. Um, and so that's her illness. Um, by the way, the word cripple, we don't use this word today anymore. Today we use the word disabled. Uh, it's considered more polite. And the noun is a disability. Dis means uh, not or no or cancel. And so disability means not having a kind of ability. Now, if you read things from like the late 1990s or even some things today, you will see people use the word handicapped. Uh, this is no longer considered the most polite word. It used to be more polite. Uh, it's a euphemism, wei wan si. So it used to be more polite, uh, but uh, something happened to change this. But first, let's talk a bit about the word handicapped. The word handicap means uh, something that makes doing something harder. So, for example, in horse racing, if we know that one of the horses is much faster than the others, uh, the organizers of the race might add a handicap to the fast horse which means they would um, fill some bags with sand or like a heavy thing and put it uh, on over the horse's back to slow down the horse and to make the race uh, more fair. So the, the sandbags would be the handicap, the thing that makes the horse race harder. Uh, another place that the word handicap is used is in golf. So uh, when you play golf, the each game has 18 rounds. So there are 18 courses where you have to try to hit the ball into the hole. For each course, depending on, on how hard the course is, uh, there will be a standard number of strokes or number of times where you can hit the ball. So for example, if on this course, uh, the number of strokes is five. This means that if I get the ball into the hole by hitting it exactly five times, my score is zero. Uh, if I can get the ball into the hole using fewer strokes than five, so I hit it only four times or three times, then my score would be one or two. But if I use more strokes than five, if I have to hit the ball six times or seven times, my score would be minus one or minus two. Now, when you're playing golf with someone else and that someone else is very good at golf, sometimes you, you will all agree to add a handicap to the good player, which means that for that player, you would lower the number of strokes, which is called a par. You would lower the par. So for example, on this course, uh, it, if everyone else has a par of five, which means they have to get the ball into the hole within five strokes, for the person with the handicap, they might have uh, 
a power of four or even three. So if everyone gets the ball into the hole uh, by hitting it five times, everyone else would have a score of zero, but the person with the handicap would have a score of minus one or minus two. Uh, so it's uh, also something that makes the game of golf harder for this person. That's a handicap. So uh, before when they called the disability handicap, that's what they meant, that this uh, situation for that person makes their life harder. So it's kind of like a handicap. Um, but then a problem happened, which is uh, when the US government was uh, and US Congress was first passing a law to help disabled people, they didn't actually talk to disabled people or you know people fighting for government help. So the law ended up not really helping a lot of uh, disabled people. And even the parts that did help disabled people made them very angry because they themselves were not able to uh, suggest the best way to help them. Uh, so because the word handicap was used in that law, in order to separate uh, themselves from what the government was doing, disabled people decided to change what to call themselves and they changed it to disabled. Uh, so today, uh, if you use the word handicap, um, it sort of tells people that you are uh, not um, entirely up to date with your language because today the polite word is disabled. And the word cripple is a much older word that means to um, a, to cripple as a verb means to make unable to work, unable to do things. Um, and today the word cripple is seen as an insult. So uh, don't use this word, but this book is from 1817, so. Um, so this is Mrs. Smith's situation. She's a widow, she's poor, she has debt, and she is disabled. But, uh, as it says here, neither sickness nor sorrow seem to have closed her heart or ruined her spirits. Um, she has two rooms, but because she can't walk, she cannot move from one to the other without assistance. And there was only one servant in the entire house. So she lives in a place with two rooms, um, but that's only one part of the big house. Uh, the house is being rented out to many different people, but the entire house only has one servant. Um, yet in spite of all this, uh, Anne had reason to believe that she had moments only of languor and depression to hours of occupation and enjoyment. So uh, that Mrs. Smith has languor, which means um, laziness, but in a good way, like lying around uh, resting, enjoying uh, resting, and depression, which is, you know, understandable in this situation. Mrs. Smith also had occupation, which means something to do, and enjoyment. How could it be? Um, and so Anne kept observing and she finally decided that this was not a case of fortitude, which means strength, inner strength, mental strength, or of resignation only. Resignation here means to accept one's fate, uh, not try to change things. Um, so it's not just these two only. A submissive spirit, 
that submits to fate, that accepts fate, might be patient, a strong understanding would supply resolution. Resolution here means the same thing as fortitude, inner strength, mental strength. But here was something more. Here was that elasticity of mind. Elasticity means flexibility, uh, easy to change. And here it's not talking about changing your mind. It's talking about using your mind to change how you see the situation. Uh, so in this case, Mrs. Smith's situation is terrible, but her elasticity of mind allowed her to see the good parts, the good sides of her situation. So here was her elasticity of mind, her disposition to be comforted. That power of turning readily, which means easily, from evil to good um, and of finding employment, which means something to do, the same thing as occupation, uh, which carried her out of herself, which was from nature alone. So to carry her out of herself, uh, this herself means something very similar to this, the situation in itself. So not just the situation, but how she looks at the situation or her situation is due to nature alone. So this is her uh, natural born personality. So this helps us to answer the question, what do you think Anne admires so much in her, in Mrs. Smith? Uh, we can describe Mrs. Smith as being in a terrible situation, but still doing her best to see, to look on the bright side of things, to see the good parts of her situation. Uh, and what are those good parts? We may have time to look at them a bit later today. Uh, and so this is also why Anne admires her so much even though her situation is so terrible, uh, even without significantly improving her situation, she is able to find uh, some kind of uh, contentment, satisfaction or happiness even in her terrible situation. Or at least she is able to keep herself busy and not uh, stay depressed about her situation all the time. OK, question two. Mm -hmm. Question two. Mrs. Smith argues for the value of what some call gossip. Do you agree why or why not? Uh, OK, gossip. Uh, it, the relevant passage starts on page 102. Um, here she's talking about her nurse, uh, Nurse Rook, who comes around a few times a week to help uh, take care of Mrs. Smith, to help her uh, get into the, the hot baths uh, that are supposed to help with arthritis. Um, and Nurse Rook doesn't only take care of Mrs. Smith. She takes care of many people, uh, including, I believe, Colonel Wallace, the friend of Mr. Elliot. Um, so Mrs. Smith and Colonel Wallace share the same nurse. Um, so here, talking about Nurse Rook. This is uh, Mrs. Smith talking. She has a large acquaintance, of course, professionally, among those who can afford to buy, and she disposes of my merchandise. Um, so here she's talking about her little business of making like pin cushions and card racks, small things uh, that you might find 
around the house, and this is how Mrs. Smith makes a little money to support herself. And she sells them through Nurse Rook because Nurse Rook has many customers, people to take care of. So here Mrs. Smith says that she has a large acquaintance professionally. She knows many people through her job. And she sells my stuff for me. She disposes of my merchandise. She always takes the right time for applying. Apply here means to to sell, to try to sell. Everybody's heart is open, you know, when they have recently escaped from severe pain or are recovering the blessing of health. And Nurse Rook thoroughly understands when to speak. She is a shrewd, intelligent, sensible woman. So remember the word shrewd means uh, having practical knowledge. So she knows when to do the right thing and what is the right thing. Hers is a line for seeing human nature. Line here means job. Her job is a job that lets her see human nature. And she has a fund of good sense. Fund here means a lot of. Uh, she has a fund of good sense and observation, which as a companion make her infinitely superior to thousands of those who have only received uh, who only sorry who having only received the best education in the world know nothing worth attending to. So here Mrs Smith is saying that because Nurse Rook has such good sense and observation, she is a much better friend or companion than people who only have education from books and so know nothing that's really worth knowing. Um, and this is even more true of education at the time or in the past. Today, uh, we at least have some education regarding like uh, how society works, how the law or the economy works, or some basic psychology, uh, or you know, knowledge of our history. But at the time, the the education was uh, more classical, more like learning, uh, you know, music and literature and geometry, that kind of thing. So you know, knowing this kind of thing does not help you a lot with. Uh, communication, socializing, or knowing what is important to people in life. Call it gossip if you will. But when Nurse Rook has half an hour's leisure to bestow on me, so if she has half an hour free time to spend with me, she is sure to have something to relate to tell. Relate means tell. She is sure to have something to relate that is entertaining and profitable. Profitable here means useful. It doesn't have to be money. Something that makes one know one species better. Uh, so this is the same thing as knowing human nature. One likes to hear what is going on. Uh, to be au fait as to the newest modes of being trifling and silly. Au fait is French and the book tells us that it means aware. Um, to to know what is going on, to know the newest modes of being trifling and silly. So um, this is kind of uh, ironic or sarcastic. It's saying that most of what people do is not very important, trifling, not very important and silly. And yet this is still the kind of thing that people do like it. If it is important to know what people do, then evil, even when people do silly things, it is still important to know it. Um, 
and Anne agrees that this kind of conversation, this kind of gossip can tell you a lot about human nature. Uh, she says, Anne says, I can easily believe it. Women of that class, which is a, a lower class, a working class, have great opportunities, and if they are intelligent, may be well worth listening to. Such varieties of human nature as they are in the habit of witnessing. In the habit of means they often, often witness. Uh, and it is not merely in its follies, like silliness, that they are well read. To be well read means to know a lot. So what they know about people is not just how silly they are. Uh, for they see it, human nature, occasionally under every circumstance that can be most interesting or affecting. Affecting here means moving, emotionally moving. What instances or situations must pass before them of ardent, which means passionate, disinterested, which means not involving themselves, so only to do with other people, Self-denying attachment. Self-denying. Remember last week we talked about the things that Anne recommends Captain Benwick read to improve his uh, mindset and morals. Some of those things include memoirs of great and noble uh, of, of suffering and endurance. Because the idea is that only people who have suffered truly understand uh, the value of virtue made and life. So this is the same idea, self-denying, not for oneself. In, in other words, to suffer. Attachment. Attachment uh, here means relationship to someone else. So self-denying attachment is a relationship that helps someone else. Um, so Anne is saying that these working class people see a lot of passion, uh, uh, sorry, passionate, disinterested and self-denying relationships. And also a lot of heroism, fortitude, again, strength, mental strength, patience, resignation of all the conflicts and all the sacrifices that ennoble us most. And noble means make noble, to make us noble. A sick chamber, which is where sick people uh, sleep and live, may often furnish, which means give or provide or supply, the worth of volumes, volumes of books. So this is saying that taking care of one sick person may give us as much knowledge as reading a lot of books. Um, so this is Mrs. Smith. What Mrs. Smith sees uh, the value of gossip. It may just be talking about people's lives, uh, but it often gives us a, a window on human nature, how people think, how people behave to their families, to their friends, to themselves. Um, and understanding people is a very valuable thing. So do you agree? Why or why not? Oh yeah, I agree. Mostly I agree. Um, but also it depends on what you mean by the word gossip. We were just talking about um, stories uh, about people's lives and behavior. But today the word gossip can also mean uh, rumors that someone did something bad. Now, I don't think that that kind of gossip is as valuable. Yes, it is true. Some of those rumors may uh, be true and so would help people avoid 
um, bad people or people who do bad things. But a lot of it is just, um, you know, not true. It's it you sometimes the people who start spreading the rumor and the gossip are the bad people who, for one reason or another, uh, want to isolate someone else uh, to isolate the victim of the rumor. So that kind of gossip is sometimes valuable, but uh, you still have to try to judge for yourself to see whether the rumor makes sense or not. Uh, because remember, gossip is is uh, talk that has no evidence, no proof. But uh, the kind of gossip that Mrs. Smith and Anne are talking about, the short story from Daily Life, today we call that an anecdote. And anecdotes can be quite valuable. Um, let's take a short break here. Uh, I'll give you 15 minutes of break. Do you have questions? So while we're taking a break, you can think about question three. Do you think Anne's criticism of Mr. Elliot makes sense? Why or why not? Bottom of. Uh, 106. Uh, so if you don't have questions, let's take a short break.
OK, we're back. Let's take a look at that question. Do you think Anne's criticism of Mr. Elliot makes sense? Why? Why not? So what is her criticism? This is on near the bottom of page 106. Yeah. Yeah, near the bottom of page 106. Though they had now been acquainted a month, so they knew each other for a month. She could not be satisfied that she really knew his character. That he was a sensible man, an agreeable man. That he talked well, professed good opinions, seemed to judge properly and as a man of principle. This was all clear enough. He certainly knew what was right. Nor could she fix on any one article of moral duty evidently transgressed. So she couldn't find a single point of moral duty that he had gone against or a single kind of moral that he had uh, broken. But yet she would have been afraid to answer for his conduct. Uh, so to answer for someone or to answer for someone's behavior means uh, to explain and defend someone and their behavior. So she would have been afraid to defend him. Huh, it looks like he's OK. Why is she afraid of defending him? She distrusted the past, if not the present. Which means she her fear is not because of how Mr. Elliot is today, but because of his past. The names which occasionally dropped of former associates, the allusions to former practices and pursuits, suggested suspicions not favorable of what he had been. So judging by uh, the names of people that he used to uh, know or that he used to associate with. And um, judging by some references to things that he used to do. Pursuits and practices are activities. Uh, these people and these things suggested to Anne that he was not always such a good man, right? So suspicions not favorable of what he had been, what he had used to be. She saw that there had been bad habits, that Sunday traveling had been a common thing. So Sunday in a Christian society is supposed to be a day of rest. So traveling on Sunday was disapproved of by many Protestant denominations. A denomination is just a church. So you're not supposed to travel on Sunday. That there had been a period of his life and probably not a short one when he had been at least careless on all serious matters. So at least careless. So at least careless, well, at most would of course be like evil. So careless means he should have paid attention to something and he did not. Uh, but maybe he could also have been deliberately, intentionally not paying attention, like going against what is good and moral. So this is careless at least. And though he might now think very differently, who could answer for the true sentiments or feelings of a clever, cautious man grown old enough to appreciate a fair character? A uh, fair character here means a good character to appreciate the value of having a good character or as the novel says, reputation. How could it ever be ascertained or confirmed that his mind was truly cleansed 
that his mind has truly changed. Mr. Elliot was rational, discreet, which, mean, which means careful, polished, which means he presents a good image and reputation. But he was not open. There was never any burst of feeling, any warmth of indignation or delight. Indignation means funkai, righteous anger. At the evil or good of others. This to Anne was a decided imperfection. Decided means definite. Her early impressions were incurable. So her own values were formed by what she saw early in her life. She prized the frank, which means honest. The open hearted, the eager character beyond all others. Character here still means personality, not person. Warmth and enthusiasm did captivate her still. Um, let's skip to the next paragraph. Mr. Elliot was too generally agreeable. Various as were the tempers in her father's house, he pleased them all. So even though the temper, pishing, the temperament of everyone in Sir Walter's house is so various, so different for each person. There are many different kinds, and yet Mr. Elliot pleased them all. He endured too well, stood too well with everybody. He had spoken to her with some degree of openness of Mrs. Clay, had appeared completely to see what Mrs. Clay was about and to hold her in contempt. And yet Mrs. Clay found him as agreeable as anybody. So even though he had talked about Mrs. Clay with Anne, had seemed to agree with Anne that Mrs. Clay is perhaps not a good person, and yet even Mrs. Clay found him to be agreeable. Now, there are two ways to understand this. Um, either um, well, I mean, I should say there are two ways of understanding why someone would still want to maintain good relationships with bad people. One reason is because we live in a society. We don't know man is an island. In order to get things done, sometimes you will have to work with people that you would not want to work with. And yet you will still have to work with them. And so the best way to do that is to try to, to maintain uh, cordial relations, which means that you're polite, you can work together, but no more than that. Um, so here, Mrs. Clay is part of the Elliot household uh, in that she's always visiting and she's a good friend of Elizabeth. So if Mr. Elliot wants to maintain good relations with the Elliot household, he would also have to maintain good relations with Mrs. Clay. Um, but there's another way to understand this. If you have to work with someone that you think is not just hard to work with, but is truly someone who is bad, has terrible morals, is a harm to society, a danger to society, you can choose not to work with them. Uh, it would sacrifice some of your own career, but if you truly believe this is a terrible person, it may be worth sacrificing some of your own career to keep this person from hurting others. Or even if you're just in a social situation and not for business, uh, you many people would think that it's proper to avoid uh, getting to know people that you think are terrible people. 
um, because if you please everyone, including the people you think are terrible, what does that say about your own morals? What do you stand for if if anyone pushes you, you immediately fall away. You immediately step aside. So this is what uh, and this is Anne's criticism of Mr. Elliot that. He doesn't seem to stand for something and he he's always polite and careful and says the right things and does the right things, but we never feel his emotion. We never feel what he cares about, what he is for, what he is against, the people that he agrees with, because it looks like he agrees with everybody. And Anne thinks that maybe he is hiding something based on his past, based on his current improbably perfect behavior. Like it's impossible to to it, impress and and uh, please everyone. When people are so different, how is it possible that you can please everyone like that's that doesn't make sense. So he must be trying very, very hard not to make anyone dislike him. He's trying very hard to make everyone like him. Why? Why is he trying so hard? This is Anne's criticism of Mr. Elliot, and I think it makes sense. Nobody's perfect, so if you're trying very hard to be perfect, it's very likely that you might be hiding something. Now, the novel suggests that what he is hiding is the fact that he is not actually a good person. But there is another possibility, uh, not in the novel, but like in daily life. If you find someone who's trying very hard to make everyone like them, one other possible thing that they are hiding is their own insecurity. The idea that they don't feel confident in themselves, they need the approval of other people. Um, that could be something that they are hiding. Like they don't have a self, their self is defined on other people. And that's why they try so hard to make everyone like them. But the, the novel here suggests that Mr. Elliot is not insecure. It suggests that Mr. Elliot is perhaps not a good man. We'll see next week. Uh, right now it's just a suspicion. It's just a rumor. Next week we will have proof. Next question. Anne believes that Louisa's fall will affect almost every aspect of Louisa's life. Do you agree? Why or why not? So let's look at this. Page 111. Um, this paragraph. Anne here is talking about Louisa's marriage with Captain Benwick. She saw no reason against their being happy. Louisa had fine naval fervor to begin with. Fervor here means passion, so a passion for naval things. Uh, and they would soon grow more alike. Hmm. Do you think that's true that uh, married couples grow more and more alike? I think sometimes. But it's even more likely that they grow more and more understanding of each other and tolerant of each other. So because like the longer you you're staying married with someone, the more you understand that person, your spouse. It doesn't mean that you will become like your spouse, but it does mean that you understand them and that you accept them for the kind of person that they are. Hopefully. Um, so will they grow more and more like? Maybe, could be, not sure. He would gain cheerfulness and she would learn to be an enthusiast for Scott and Lord Byron. Remember these two poets. 
Now, Benwick would, I think, gain cheerfulness, not necessarily because Louisa is cheerful, but because he would be slowly leaving behind his grief at the death of Fanny Harville. Oh, sorry, yawning. So with a new wife, he would no longer feel as sad or as depressed about Fanny. And so, of course, he would gain cheerfulness. And Louisa, Anne thinks, would learn to enjoy Benwick's favorite poetry. Uh, then Anne thinks, no, 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 that was probably learnt already. Maybe she already learned to love his poetry. Of course they had fallen in love over poetry. So actually, no, they didn't even need to be married for Louisa to grow more like Benwick in terms of literary taste. And sentimental reflection, because this poetry is sentimental and romantic, uh, that kind of romantic poetry. The day at Lyme, the fall from the cob, might influence her health, her nerves, which means mental health, her courage, her character to the end of her life, as thoroughly as it appeared to have influenced her fate. OK, let's look at this. So how did the fall influence her fate? Well, it brought her in contact with Benwick. And they are now getting married. That's what this means. That's her fate. In other words, the rest of her life, her marriage. But what about these other things? It might influence her health. Yeah, I can see that. Maybe like uh, she'll no longer be as healthy as she was before. Her nerves, her mental health. Yeah, maybe she'll have like, I don't know, headaches or dizziness for the rest of her life. Who knows? Her courage and her character. Let's look at these two together. Her courage is part of her character. Remember that everyone liked Louisa and Henrietta Musgrove because they were young and energetic and fashionable and cheerful. Part of that character requires courage. The courage to, to continue doing what you want to do or what you think is the right thing even when everyone else tells you no. Of course, this courage is partly why she fell off the cob at Lyme, had, why she had her accident. And so, of course, her courage will be affected. If her courage led her to have the accident, she will most likely rethink what it means to have courage. And this would be a change in her character. So a single fall seems to have radically changed many aspects of her life. So when Anne says this, yeah, I agree. But I do think that it's not that simple. Clearly, Louisa will not be as energetic and courageous as she used to be. But still, I think within her person, there will be a deep sense of cheerfulness or satisfaction and maybe still courage like when it comes to doing something hard that she knows is right maybe she will still have that courage but not for daily things not for like having fun um yeah and it is true like life happens like this uh, a single event can sometimes change our life forever uh, and you may not know it at the time, but maybe you will feel that things have changed. So yeah, this is entirely possible. Okay, last question. 
and believes that Captain Wentworth must still love her. Do you agree? Why or why not? Can you give examples or evidence? Well, remember the first time we talked about this question. I think it was the first week. The question was Wentworth had uh, she had no power over Wentworth. And do you agree? Why or why not? And most of you gave evidence to show why Wentworth actually still does care about Anne. And that evidence was that he behaved toward Anne differently than he behaved toward other women. Less polite. Less compliments. Or fewer compliments, no compliments actually. And difference in behavior means difference in attitude, which sort of tells us that he still kind of likes her. But here, uh, but at the time, Anne did not know. Here, Anne finally has this thought. Why? What is the evidence? Let's look at this. 123. Uh, well, let's start from 122. Here, uh, she is talking with, sorry, 121. It's a long conversation. Here, she is talking with Wentworth about what happened in Lyme and the impending marriage between Benwick and Louisa. OK, this is Wentworth. With all my soul, I wish them happy and rejoice over every circumstance in favor of it. They have no difficulties to contend with at home, no opposition, no caprice, no delays. So both the Harvilles and the Musgroves approve of the marriage between Benwick and Louisa. The Musgroves are behaving like themselves most honorably and kindly. So that's what this means themselves, that they are honorable and kind. So it's a compliment. Only anxious with true parental hearts to promote their daughter's comfort. All this is much, very much in favor of their happiness. More than perhaps. He stopped. A sudden recollection seemed to occur and to give him some taste of that emotion which was reddening Anne's cheeks and fixing her eyes on the ground. So when he says more than perhaps and stops, he remembers something and Anne also remembers something because that's what's making her cheeks red and making her unable to look at him. She has to look at the ground. She's embarrassed. So what do they both remember? In this marriage between Benwick and Louisa, both families approve. Is there a marriage that both sides or at least one side did not approve? Why, yes, there is the former engagement between Wentworth and Anne. Right? Anne's family completely opposed her marriage to Wentworth because not only is he a sailor, but at the time he was a poor sailor. So by talking about this and then making a comparison, even when he doesn't say what the comparison is, uh, they both know what he's talking about and it makes them very embarrassed. I confess, uh, Wentworth continues. Right after clearing his throat. <clears throat> clearing his throat. He proceeded thus, so he continued. I confess that I do think there is a disparity, which means a difference. Too great a disparity and in a point no essential than mind. So he thinks that perhaps the one problem this marriage might face is the difference in mind or mindset or even we might say education uh, between Louisa and Benwick. I regard Louisa Musgrove as a very amiable, which means friendly, sweet tempered girl and not deficient in understanding. 
notice that he doesn't say that she has understanding. He says that she is not deficient in understanding. She does not lack understanding, which means that she has some understanding, not a lot, not very good, just some. But Benwick is something more. He is a clever man, a reading man. Let's skip this. Um, but notice what he, he is saying. He's saying that maybe Louisa is not good enough for Benwick. Isn't that strange? Because at this moment, everyone still thinks that Wentworth loves Louisa. Do you think that per someone who loves Louisa would talk this way about her? Uh, and after the conversation, was no longer able to pay attention to anything else in the room. She was struck, gratified, confused, and beginning to breathe very quick and to feel a hundred things in a moment. To be struck means to be taken by surprise. She was surprised. Gratified uh, means uh, she understands, she agrees. Confused and beginning to breathe very quick, so she's excited. And to feel everything at once. Why? Because Captain Wentworth has basically just said that he did, he did not really love Louisa. And if he does not love Louisa, could it be possible that he still loves Anne? Hmm. Um, it was so continuing. It was impossible for her to enter on such a subject. So she can't really join this conversation because she's too excited and embarrassed. And yet out of politeness, she feels the necessity of speaking. So she decides to say you were a good while at Lyme, I think. This is an extremely interesting choice of words. She feels like she needs to continue the conversation, but she's not really ready to talk about this. So she gives, uh, she says something that requires the least amount of brain power. You spent a lot of time at Lyme, right? She already knows the answer. Yes, Wentworth spent a lot of time at Lyme. And so by asking a question that she already knows the answer to, she doesn't have to pay attention to him. She doesn't have to focus because right now she's so excited and confused that she can't focus. And notice that Anne in the novel is the person who usually is the only person to keep her head. Everyone else is over emotional, nervous, excited, can't think clearly. It is usually Anne who is the only person who can think clearly. But now she is disturbed. She is excited. She has lost her head. Uh, so she gives this non statement and then after Wentworth answers, she says, I should very much like to see Lyme again. And this is a very stupid thing to say. And it tells us that she really is not using her brain. Why is it stupid? Because Lyme is the place where Louisa had her accident. And so if she goes to Lyme so soon after Louisa had her accident, for the average person, seeing all of those familiar places and having all of those familiar memories would simply remind her of Louisa's accident and would make her sad. And yet Anne says, I would very much like to go again, which tells us she's really not using her brain. Uh, she can't deal with this conversation at all. If nothing bad had happened at Lyme, then this would be the polite thing to say. So she's like going on autopilot. She's really not thinking about this. Um, 
and then finally Lady Dalrymple and Miss Carteret arrive. Um, Wentworth is separated from her. Um, let's see, is this the right page? 123, oh, okay. And things happen. And then finally, when things settle down, Anne saw nothing, thought nothing of the brilliancy of the room. This is talking about all the socially important people in the room. She cared and thought and saw nothing. Her happiness was from within. Her eyes were bright and her cheeks glowed, but she knew nothing about it. She was thinking only of the last half hour, and as they passed to their seats to prepare for the performance, her mind took a hasty range over it. So to take a range over something. Today we would say her mind replayed the events of the past half hour. But of course, uh, in 1817, they did not have uh, CDs. They did not have cassette players. There's no such thing as a replay. So it's the same thing, though. She went back to review what happened in the last past hour, half hour. His Wentworth's choice of subjects to talk about conversation subjects, his expressions and still more his manner and look had been such as she could see in only one light, so she could only understand all of this evidence one way. His opinion of Louisa Musgrove's inferiority. Which he had seemed solicitous to give, so he wanted to say it. Nobody had to force him to say it. He wanted to say this. His half averted eyes, eyes which could not really look at Anne. And more than half expressive glance. So when he did look at Anne, it's the glance, the look said a lot. All, all declared that he had a heart returning to her at least. At least, which means returning to her. At least it was returning uh, more. If it what's more than at least is maybe he had always loved her. So at least it might be returning at most. Maybe he always loved her. Uh, that anger, resentment, avoidance were no more. This is talking about his reaction to Anne's breaking of the engagement. It seems like he's no longer angry, resentful, uh, or wanting to avoid her because of this, because she broke off the engagement, were no more. And that these feelings were succeeded, which means followed, not merely by friendship and regard, regard here means respect, but by the tenderness of the past, the same tenderness that he had in the past. Yes, some share of the tenderness of the past. This change, yes, uh, first she says the tenderness of the past, then she says yes, some share of, some part of the tenderness of the past. This tells us that she knows that maybe she is being too excited. It's not very likely that Wentworth would have all of the tenderness of the past. That she would think this is because she's too excited. After she she pauses and then thinks a bit more and realizes it's more reasonable to expect some share of the tenderness of the past, not all of it. She could not contemplate the change as implying less. He must love her. Bum bum bum. So that's the evidence. A lot of evidence that we just looked at. And so yes, of course we agree uh, that he still loves her, but we agree for more than just the evidence that we see. We have one other reason to think that maybe Wentworth still uh, loves her. Uh, yes, that's right. Anne is saying she does not really know Mr. Elliot. Uh, and we, last week we talked about Mr. Elliot's apology, right? Where um, he tries so hard to make 
Sir Walter accept him into the family again? Why? Uh, and here you're saying maybe because uh, he wanted to inherit Kellynch to become the next Sir Walter. Yeah, could be. And so connected with today's evidence, um, it could be saying that Mr. Elliot, deep in his heart, knows that he is not a good person, that he does not deserve to be the next Sir Walter. So he has to try very hard. He has to pretend and present himself as a very good person. So yeah, maybe that's what's going on. We'll see next week. OK, back to this question. There's another reason for us to think that Wentworth still loves Anne. And that reason is because of the way that the story is designed. Think about this. We know that in order to marry, two people in this story have to be from the same or similar social class, and they both have to be single. So who can Anne marry? Who is a single man of the same or similar social class? We only have two, Wentworth and Benwick, not Benwick, sorry, Mr. Elliot. Um, now, it's possible that there are, oh, let's finish this first. Okay, so either Wentworth or Mr. Elliot. And we already know that Anne does not like Mr. Elliot. She does not trust him. So that only leaves us Wentworth. Uh, on the other hand, if Wentworth wants to marry a woman, uh, the only two single women of uh, acceptable social class are Anne and Elizabeth. And we know that nobody likes Elizabeth. She's proud and vain, um, not a good person to, to marry. So that only leaves Anne. So if you look at it from one direction, there's only Wentworth, if you look at it from the other direction, there is only Anne. So if Anne and Wentworth must marry somebody, it's incredibly likely that they will marry each other. And so by design of the novel, they it, we, we know, or at least we can expect that they will marry. So by design of the novel, they must love each other. Now, I say that this is the design of the novel, not the story, because it's possible that there are more upper class single men and women in the world of the story that we do not see because they are not included in the novel. We never, the novel never tells us that only Anne and Wentworth are left. It simply only shows us Anne and Wentworth, but it's possible that there are more single upper class people walking around town uh, and that Anne and Wentworth simply are not interested in them, and so they are not included in the novel. So this is not a part of the story. This is the design of the novel. By design, there are no more single upper class people. Um, and this kind of design actually is very common and has a classical origin. So uh, those are the five questions. I'm just going to keep talking about this idea of the design of a romance. Um, so. No. So in Shakespeare's day. The definition of a comedy is not that it's funny. The definition of a comedy is that all the good people get married by the end. That's a comedy. And the definition of a tragedy is that all the or many good people die by the end. Anyways, so in a comedy, if by the end of the play someone is not married, but it's a comedy, then you know that this person is not a good person. So in other words, sometimes at by the end of the comedy, uh, you will see people suddenly getting married to each other. Like you, there, it's not a lot of love. There's not a lot of passion, but because it's a comedy and good people have to be married, Shakespeare will suddenly have people marry each other. 
and that was an accepted part of what it was to write a comedy. That's by design, not by story. Today, uh, when we watch like a romantic comedy, uh, you will often notice something similar. Like the the main man and the main woman will end up with each other simply because it's a romantic comedy. Uh, they fall in love with each other simply because one is the leading man and the other is the leading woman. Even when the two actors have no chemistry, no passion, simply do not feel like they would be together, they will still end up together because it's a romantic comedy. That's also by design. Uh, and today we don't think this is a good thing. We don't think this is very artistic or very authentic. Uh, the criticism of this kind of design is that it is overdetermined, which means that it is determined or decided not just by what happens in the story, but also by the design of the, st of the movie or of the novel or of the play. It's more than determined. It's overdetermined. And today we don't think that's very uh, good art. So, uh, I, so for me, like my personal favorite uh, romantic movie, it's not really a comedy because it doesn't end well, but um, it ends kind of sadly. Spoiler, sorry. But my favorite uh, romantic movie is a movie called Unrelated, directed by the British director Joanna Hogg. And I like this one because it's one of the few movies, romantic movies, where at first you can't really tell who is going to end up with, uh, in this case, the woman. So the story is like a woman comes to visit some uh, a family of friends, uh, and there are a group of uh, like men, men and women like having fun on vacation. And at first we we don't really we can't really see like which of the men she's going to end up with. But slowly as the movie observes this group of friends and their interactions with the woman, we slowly get to see who is interested in her and who she is interested in. So it's not overdetermined. There is it's not simply because the man is the leading man, but it's it's more a natural kind of development of their relationship of their relationship. By the way, this is also the first movie starring Tom Hiddleston, otherwise known as Loki. Uh, it was his first movie and he's very good in this movie. Um, so you can look for this if you're interested. OK, uh, so those are the five questions. Do you want to ask me anything? Do you have questions? No questions. OK, uh, then let's go back to the beginning of this week's reading. Chapter 17. This is page. 100, 100. So uh, at the end of the previous chapter, Sir Walter and Elizabeth we're trying to re-establish relations with the very socially important Lady Dalrymple and Miss Carteret, who live in, uh, when they visit Bath, they live in Laura Place. So while Sir Walter and Elizabeth were assiduously, which means uh, trying very hard, pushing their good fortune in Laura Place, which means trying to win good fortune, uh, or you know, to to you, good fortune could also mean good luck. So to try to depend on good luck, to get to reacquaint themselves with Miss Carteret and Lady Dalrymple, Anne was renewing an acquaintance of a very different description. She had called on her former governess. Governess is uh, it, it's uh, an old job for women who teach and take care of someone else's kids. So it's a nanny and a tutor. 
Um, think about the movie The Sound of Music. Chen San Mei. The the leading woman is the governess for the the man's children. That's how she uh, became part of the family. Uh, so Anne had called on her former governess, which means she visited her former governess and had heard from her of there being an old school fellow in Bath or a schoolmate who had the two strong claims on her attention of past kindness and present suffering. So because this old school fellow used to be kind to Anne and is currently suffering, and both are good reasons or claims uh, for Anne to go visit her. Miss Hamilton, now Mrs. Smith, had shown her kindness in one of those periods of her life, Anne's life, when it had been most valuable. Anne had gone unhappy to school. Uh, so at that time, school was always boarding school. You would live at the school. Anne had gone unhappy to school, grieving for the loss of a mother whom she had dearly loved. So her mother, Lady Elliot, had only just died. Feeling her separation from home because she's living away and suffering as a girl of 14, of, uh, which means she was 14 years old. Of strong sensibility, which means she was very sensitive. And not high spirits must suffer at such a time. So this sentence says that any young girl of 14 years of age who is sensitive and is sad must suffer like Anne suffered. <sighs> and Miss Hamilton, three years older than herself, so she's 17, but still from her want of near relations and a settled home remaining another year at school. So even though she's already 17, she's still at the school because she does not have, want means lack, so she does not have near relations, so close family, and also does not have a settled home. These two things kind of go together. A home is where you live with your close family. If you don't have close family, maybe you have more distant family, and maybe you have two families that are equally distant. So there's no reason for you to live with one family and not another family because they are equally close. Their distance is the same. There is no one family that you can call home. Maybe you have to move from one to the other over the course of the year. So she does not have a settled home. Therefore, she remained another year at school, had been useful and good to Anne, in a way which had considerably lessened her misery and could never be remembered with indifference. Indifference means don't care. So whenever Anne remembers Miss Hamilton, she always remembers it with great emotion and gratefulness, gratitude. Miss Hamilton had left school, had married not long afterwards, and was said to have married a man of fortune which means he was rich. And this was all that Anne had known of her till now that their governess's account brought her situation forward, which means to the present day, from the past to the present, up to date, in a more decided, which means confirmed, certain, but very different form. So uh, she only knew that he had, uh, Anne only knew that she had married rich, but now her governess is telling her that uh, is giving her news that is certain. It's definite news, but it's very different from Anne's memory of her being rich and married. And we just talked about this. She's widow and poor, not married anymore, no longer having money. Uh, and we actually talked a lot about this. Um, Let's stop here. Do you have questions about today's lecture?
No. Okay. 